Africa branch secretary of the NHT Cheshire branch, um, and I'm also the head teacher of Hartford Manor Primary School and Nursery. I'm delighted today to welcome Dr. Matt Butler from um, the Cambridge University Hospital Trust, who's going to be talking to us about um, transmission, um, what we've learned since last CoronaCast, um, he's also going to talk to us about um, um, asymptomatic spread and various topics. But as always, we've got the chat function there, and Dan will tell you how that works. So Dan, could you just tell us how the chat function works? And how the Chronicast yeah, good, mo well. good morning, everybody. The uh, Chronicast will be running for uh, up to an hour this morning. Um, if you do, keep your mics muted, please, unless you're asked to uh, contribute. If you want to um, ask a question, please use the chat function. Um, I am recording this session. and Hopefully, we'll be able to publish it at a later date. Um, but if you don't want your faces to appear on this, just turn your um, camera off. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Dan, have you got somebody to, to curate the questions at, um, from the chat function today? Um, I haven't asked anybody, but Tracy, as you're in the top left hand of my screen, would you uh, would you like to curate questions today? Yeah, I can do that, Dan. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. That's great. <clears throat> okay, welcome, Matt. Well, Matt, uh, it's six weeks since we last saw Matt, but uh, we also had some um, some Corona cast before with Matt, and I think Matt was certainly instrumental in building confidence in my school community around uh, a safe return to school. So, Matt, thank you so much. First, Corona cast covered knowledge around the virus and how it spreads, which helped us. But the second one certainly, um, we were able to take those steps that you talked about in Corona cast one to open our school safely. So, I think you've done a tremendous job in terms of building confidence across the education community i know schools have your video on their website when you go and on their front page and uh, i did see an article about you in the cambridge press as well so thank you for all you've done for building it uh, building confidence because you know the more we know about this disease the more we're going to be able to open our schools safely and carry on with some normality of education so we've all been back for eight weeks um i know teachers have experienced in pretty, pretty high levels of tiredness and, and exhaustion but um, I think you know, from, from my part of the world which is Cheshire West it's been a pretty successful opening of our primary schools so um, I just wanted to talk to you first about what happened in the last six weeks in the medical world since we last met for our corona cast on September the 9th. So um, uh, thank you um, Simon for the introduction so um, what, what is um, uh, different this time around? So the second wave, if you if you want to call it, it that. I mean, realistically, in epidemiological terms, we've never really exited the first wave. This is just the second hump of the the first wave. If you were to think of how these things are normally seasonal and and spread, but um, the, the, this sort of second hump of um, of, of infection. Um, given that we now have um, upwards of around about three hundred thousand tests. A day we're able to actually find out um, uh, where the infection mainly is is, is being spread um, and as you would expect like the first wave started in London this um, this uh, um, round of, of, um, of infection seems to be mainly um, located up into the um, northwest and then isolated um, suburbs suburbs of London um, quite um, densely populated areas um, and what we know outside of students um, is that it's mainly in um, sort of lower socioeconomic and socially deprived um, areas that are perhaps more likely to be um, uh, more densely um, uh, um, uh, li living um, in more densely um, occupied housing, but also probably multi-generational housing um, as well. So then the risk of, of sort of not only spreading it um, from um, sort of um, adults to children, children to adults, but also to elder um, relatives, which is all also sort of feeding into um, hospital admissions. Because mm -hmm. remember, the, the number one risk factor for this, um, this virus, and we know this um, over and over now across multiple countries, multiple studies, um, the biggest risk factor um, over and above um, gender and um, ethnicity is, is age. Um, so the, the, the key sort of um, figure hasn't changed much in that 50% of the deaths are, are in the over 80s. That is the same as in this, this round. Um, we do, um, I think the last time I spoke, we, um, I was talking about more um, drug therapies that we have. Unfortunately, actually, we've, we've lost one of those drug therapies. So remdesivir, we were giving um, with the hope that it would reduce length of stay, but the World Health Organization has done a, a larger study of that drug and didn't actually show um, any change to length of stay and certainly no impact on mortality. So although we're still giving that, it's, um, it's, it's unfortunately less of a, um, a help than we initially 
um, thought. Um, we obviously have the, the steroids dexamethasone, but the biggest change I think for this round of infections um, is that the intensive care um, doctors, the anaesthetists and intensivists that look after the very sick, um, they have changed um, the way they manage these um, patients such that um, we're opting for more non-invasive forms of, of ventilation and oxygenation um, before, um, uh, before we reach for the mechanical ventilator. Um, and there's some hope that that will um, uh, sort of um, uh, confer a, a, a greater survivability. Um, we certainly are seeing lower rates of, of mortality in those that go to intensive care. Um, but I think what we aren't seeing um, compared to the first time round is the is the numbers yet. So it'd be interesting to sort of follow up the northwest whether that reduction in in mortality for um, patients admitted to intensive care actually um, continues as the numbers that are going to intensive care, because obviously that has a staff and a resource um, implication. If the numbers go up, then perhaps um, mortality rates may increase as. As, as, as the system becomes um, becomes more constrained. Um, I think we are in a better position with that as well, because we also have the, um, it, this isn't necessarily a, a national, it's more of a regional issue as things stand at the moment. So there will obviously be the opportunity for um, 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 transferring patients to other areas of the country where, where intensive care beds to become constrained. Um, I think what we, um, in particular to children, uh, what we know, so obviously the last time I spoke, we, we discussed at length the, uh, um, the data from the, the first round of, um, of transmission in the spring, um, going into the um, summer holidays for the, um, for the key worker children and, and for the year groups that then returned. Um, what we know um, from uh, th those studies and that those trans transmission dynamics is that um, children um, are still often the, the receiving end of, of infection. They, they rarely, although it, it was documented um, that there was um, evidence of transmission from pupils to teachers, but it, out of the hundreds of thousands of pupils, um, it was measured in the, um, the sort of low tens of, of, of cases of transmission. Um, the vast majority of transmission was um, between staff groups. So going back to what I've said previously is that it's not necessarily the classroom that's the, the highest risk, it's the, it's the staff rooms, it's the informal sort of meetings that you would have with other, um, with other adults where, where transmission is, is going to be more likely. Yeah, it's certainly been borne out in Cheshire West where we're seeing staff to staff. Um, if there are outbreaks in schools, it's uh, it's more common to be staff to staff. So um, I think uh, we've we've all had to go and uh, make sure that uh, social distancing between our staff, which is far more achievable actually than than people to people in many ways in the school, that we're, we're adhering to that. And I know staff have been far better um, at that as they've got used to it. I think we all relaxed over the summer. I think we all kind of took our out the ball. And I, I remember coming back in September and, uh, and staff weren't really following those guidelines, but I know schools have done really well in terms of implementing those different measures for staff. But Matt, there has been an increase since we returned to school in September. And if you look at the return to school in September, and we've suddenly seen the graph go um, um, exponentially again. Um, so, um, what 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 do we think has caused that um, that exponential growth since September? Yeah. So, um, remember, with all of these events, um, in order to, to determine whether or not something has caused an effect, it will only ever have an effect in the the following two weeks. So, if I change something now nationally. Um, I wouldn't expect it to actually um, show up in the case numbers um, two weeks um, uh, um, from that. So I think um, you're, you're very right. If you looked at the graphs, there is a very sharp uptick um, at the start of September. Um, so what that tells you is that actually the, the, the rate of growth started mid-August. Um, and I think that was as the weather um, turned um, worse um, towards the, the, the sort of the latter end of August as, as things got a bit colder and, and wetter and people were then going indoors. And then, and then mid-September, there was another sharp uptick. So I think certainly um, schools and universities opening has led to more transmission and it was always expected to. Um, there's um, uh, the, the um, SAGE modelling um, when looking at what things to do in order to reduce transmission, because remember schools are not just um, areas where children congregate, they're areas where people go to work, um, adults sort of meet, um, parents mix, and then with, when schools go back, um, there's probably more informal meetings between family groups 
um, outside of that people arranging um, uh, to get together um, off school campus. So I think it, schools as a as an intervention, schools opening um, will inevitably lead to um, more transmission. I think the estimate for the R is that it might um, it might push it up half a point. And um, so if we were at 1.5 now, closing schools may well drop us to below one. Um, the the um, so it definitely has has increased transmission um, a lot of other things as well um, this is this is very likely to be a seasonal um, virus although um, remembering back to the first coronavirus, the only country really to experience this virus in winter was China um, and they managed to instigate measures that we would um, find un, uh, sort of intolerable um, with with sort of state sanctions and, and, and financial punishments fairly early on fairly a fairly um, draconian lockdown um, initiated um, initially, um, although looking at what they did, um, they are obviously in a much better um, position um, position now. Um, I suspect that that sort of those sorts of measures that are having to be imposed in China aren't sustainable in the longer term. And ultimately, um, if um, if a vaccine um, wasn't sort of produced in the next um, sort of six months, um, then certainly I think China going into winter is going to see a significant um, increase in infection. Um, I think if you were to look at the age groups that are affected, um, the age bands that the government are producing aren't really that helpful when you try and drill down to primary and secondary school because they seem to want to include secondary school um, to colleges and universities, which really isn't um, that helpful because most of the transmission, if you look at the um, heat maps, is in the over um, 16s. Um, it's in the young adults up to the age of around about 25 to 30, um, but, but starting from age 16. So actually the, in, the, in the school population, there aren't um, the high numbers that you would expect if they were the drivers for infection. What you are seeing is that those in cases in younger adults um, are not only transmitting up the age bands, so we're now seeing more sort of over 60s getting the infection, but their younger siblings, when they go and see them, um, at half terms or um, informally at the weekends are also now getting infected. So I think it is looking like when we had the infection in the first round um, that, um, that children are sort of seemingly on the receiving end of infection. Um, and I think the other thing to note is that as we test more and as we look into more um, uh, schools, we will pick up more um, sort of asymptomatic um, carriers um, of infection. Um, but it's still not known to what extent um, they are um, infectious. They're very likely to be infectious, but I think to a much lesser extent um, than, say, someone that's that's coughing and have, has a fever. OK, thank you. Natch. I saw that heat map that you shared on Twitter last night, so we'll share that with the group, down later, if that's OK, because that, that was a good take, because we have been, um, a, a lot of people have been concerned about the 10 to 19 spread and seeing that that's uh, overtaken the 20 to, to 29, oh, well, it wasn't spread, sorry, it was incidents per um, 100,000. Many of us on the call are in areas of Tier 2 or even Tier 3 um, uh, lockdown, um, because we're predominantly Northwest uh, school leaders. Um, in terms of the, the measures which are being taken um, to put school, I mean, I know Cheshire West is, we, we had quite a flat week last week, so um, we had very little spread, but what's, uh, are these, are these, are these restrictions working? Because we've seen places like uh, Oldham that have been in these restrictions now for over a hundred days. So mm. are they working? Is, is it slowing the, the growth or is it, um, is it, do, do we need to do more? So um, it's, that's an excellent question. Um, I, I, I'll answer this in, in sort of two ways. So firstly, um, the, the government strategy um, seems to be reducing the R number, which is obviously a, a the main focus. What they haven't said is what their target is. Um, so um, I, looking at the measures that they've put in place, the chief medical officer stated very clearly, even if you went into tier three, the base case would not reduce the R to below one. So either we're in the situation whereby we're accepting that we're going to have an R above one and the epidemic is slowly going to grow over the winter, but that what we want it to do is to grow at a rate at which the, the, the NHS can cope and to do other services throughout winter. Um, if it is to get the R below one, um, then, then local authorities are going to have to do a, a whole lot more 
um, uh, in tier three areas in order to get that um, down to that level. Um, I think those sorts of measures have, uh, uh, without them being mandated on a national level, are by their nature going to be piecemeal, and you are going to see um, a heterogeneity in, in approach. So some local authorities may be harsher with restrictions, and then some may not. So I think nationally, tier three restrictions, if we continue down this route, are unlikely to bring um, the R below one. So we're faced then with a growing epidemic um, going into the winter. Um, now, that obviously has implications for places where transmission already is very high, because as I've said, it takes two weeks for any intervention um, to have an effect. So in Manchester, um, whereby they've only they're only going in, I think it's this it's midnight tonight, or is it Friday, um, when they go into um, tier three. Um, they are um, only going to see the effects of that um, come um, November, um, the first week in, in November. So they are going to have a huge increase in their um, uh, um, numbers of patients admitted to hospital, their total number of cases, and also their spread into younger and older populations. So outbreaks in schools um, are going to be significantly um, increasing um, over that next two weeks. And then to be honest, we don't know um, what tier three restrictions are going to achieve um, to the R. The hope is, is that it will reduce it to a, to a level, I, I think it's the strategy in order that the NHS is not overwhelmed and we can continue to treat other diseases. Um, I'm, not, I'm not that confident in an area with high transmission that that is actually going to be the case. And I think after two weeks of being in tier three restrictions, I think what you're going to find is that we may well have regional um, fire break circuit breakers, um, which will then close schools for um, some period um, in addition to all the other measures. I'm interested in the Welsh um, uh, fire break um, as well, Matt, because I've noted they, they're not closing primary schools, but they're, they're, they're closing the, the majority of the secondary schools. So what's the thinking behind that? So I think um, the same um, sort of thinking with regards to um, how this how this infection um, is um, is spread and therefore how to mitigate it. So primary schools are um, are the out of all the, the educational settings or probably nurseries as well the best sort of situationally in order to control the infection. So you have a group of pupils that are in the same room with a single teacher that then you can manage and reduce mixing between classrooms. Secondary schools, that's obviously not possible because you've got different teachers needing to teach um, uh, differing subjects. Um, and then the decision about do you move the pupil, do you move the teacher, um, and all of those things. So there is inevitably going to be more mixing in a secondary school. And also some pupils take one subject, but not others. Um, and then they're coming into different, um, different, um, different pupils. So I think that the, the not closing of primary schools from an epidemiological point of view, if you were if you were wanting to um, keep open the safest option, I think primary schools um, is is sound from a from a scientific epidemiological perspective. And I think also, I mean, I'm not an educationist, but from what I know about sort of early years, the focus on sort of um, making sure that those years are um, the best that they can be to set someone up for life. I think that's the the other reason um, why that why they've um, the why they've opted for that. It may be if it doesn't work, as I've said, in two weeks' time, that that then because they have chosen at a lower rate of transmission to hit this hard, which is um, in my view would have been the better option back in September to have done this. Um, now that we're in a higher rate of transmission in um, in England, bizarrely it actually makes more sense for places like Cambridge to go into a circuit break rather than Manchester, because actually in Manchester it will have less of an impact um, because you're already in it and the transmission is set up and that it will be in more households. Um, but um, but um, I, I think all of these things are, we still don't know what effect it will have. Um, the, the, the bizarre thing out of all of this is that even though, I've, as I've described before, how we think it's spread, there is no real way of determining um, how it actually is spreading. Um, and, um, and there are questions about, could it possibly, could there be other routes of infection? So airborne is a, is a latest 
one mm. to um, gain credence, but um, more recently, um, is it um, is there also um, fecal spread like norovirus in the winter vomiting bug? Um, is that a possibility that can account for the number of outbreaks that we're seeing? Um, so we're still in uncharted waters, but only by doing these things. And and actually, it's a reasonable. It's a it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's 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 good actually that we've got these other countries that are doing these things because if they pan out not to have had the impact that they wanted, and then ultimately they've they've taken more pain for for very little gain. But I think they 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 are sound epidemiologically and they should work. And, and there's one of the reasons Wales is going into to lockdown when it has a lower um, per 100,000 rate than Cheshire West, for example. Is it because of hospital capacity or is it because they're slightly more cautious of, um, as, as, a, as a nation? Multiple, multiple reasons. Hospital capacity. Um, so um, Wales, um, if you were to look at infra in infrastructure terms and capital spend, they, they are um, sort of grossly underfunded for their levels of, of, of deprivation. Um, out of all the um, nations of the of the country, so I think their health system does um, sort of when it's strained, it it it, it feels the impact more so than say um, than say my region. Um, but um, but I think mainly it's political decisions. These decisions mm. are um, uh, they can't be necessarily science led and driven um, um, because obviously the science is incomplete. We don't we we assume. Uh, on based on modeling studies and what's gone on previously that the x will have y effect but we we don't know for sure so it comes down to um sort of political um uh, decisions on the basis of scientific advice but obviously scientific advice differs too okay. well, but in terms of schools reopening i think we've been open now for for the time in the summer and we've now got um probably you know close to nine million children back in our schools so i think i mean it's looking more reassuring that schools aren't actually accelerating this uh, spread and and that the cases are coming in from the community we are getting cases where we're having to close uh, bubbles and we are having to uh, we are having some disruption and we're, we seem to be having that in secondaries more in our area and, and other parts of northwestern primary so is the evidence starting to build now that primary schools are in terms of the, the safety of primary schools opening it's a it's it's a it's a for staff it's a it's a it's a place where we can continue our business as operating at 90 percent normal which most of us are yeah and we can continue that through the winter yeah so um certainly schools are um are a mirror to society so whatever is happening locally um, more so in households and, and other settings is, is then being reflected in um, in schools and and certainly we aren't seeing in those age groups that they are um, they are the drivers of, of, of infection and therefore because the, the, the prevalence in in the age groups that attend school um, is low obviously teachers are, are in um, are probably in some of the age bands now that that prevalence is um, is, in, is increasing um, and so um, so from a from a sort of a workplace um, uh, standpoint, the, the 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 point which needs emphasising is that you're you're much likely uh, much more likely to catch it from someone in your in your peer group, your age group. Um, but but certainly, I've not seen any um, uh, any reason to suggest that um, that out of all of the um, workplaces that are open or or community settings that we can still visit in in sort of tier two and tier one. Um, uh, settings that schools are at uh, higher risk and and when they've looked specifically um, at teachers um, as a um, as a risk factor um, that hasn't um, there hasn't been any um, difference to the um, the wider population if you were to take um, teachers and compare them to other people based on sort of earnings there seems to be a, a slightly um, a less of a, a risk for, for um, teachers but that may well be um, there may well be other reasons for that. Um, they they couldn't adequately correct for socioeconomics, for example. So it may be that um, that although you take wage um, as a as a marker for socioeconomic status, it may be that that's that's not um, apparent if you take in the wider household. Okay, um, just want to touch on antigen tests, Max. We talked about this earlier in the summer about antigen tests being uh, being helpful for people working in the teaching profession. And I've noticed that Scotland are, are making um, the antigen test available for their teaching workforce in Scotland, but not in England. So, um, in terms of that, is there any merit in us pushing for that as a profession, or, or could it or could it give us a false sense of hope that we've we've had it once and now we've got a, a cloak of immunity? 
Um, no, I, I, I honestly do think um, uh, that once we secure um, hospitals and, and care homes, that schools um, uh, should be um, should be prioritised for um, antigen testing. They said so for those um, on the call that are not sure, not aware of what these do, but they're effectively a 15 minute test where you do your own swab or saliva test um, and read it like a pregnancy um, test as to whether or not you have infection. Um, when you compare them to the lab tests that we do um, within the hospital, they're less sensitive. So around about, um, say if you were to apply them in a school in, in Manchester, um, where the, the prevalence is higher, um, they, they pick up around about nine out of 10 infections. Um, and what, but what I think is probably more important and, and what they may show us is actually that what they will um, almost certainly pick up is infectiousness. So not necessarily whether you have the viral DNA in your nose or throat, but whether or not you have enough viral DNA in your nose and throat for you to potentially spread the infection. Um, and I think if someone is, it's, it's highly unlikely that someone is very, very infectious um, and yet is going to be one of those one in 10 um, that aren't picked up. I suspect the one in 10 that aren't picked up by these antigen tests are the people that are towards the tail end of their infection that are less likely to be infectious. And they will really be um, a, um, a game changer. So, for example, in a school setting, um, you get a phone call from um, a parent telling you that they're um, that, that, a member of their class has tested positive. Another one then maybe come up the next day and then you're, you're faced with a potentially closing down, um, a, a potentially in secondary schools, a fairly large um, bubble. Um, these tests would then allow you to test absolutely everyone um, and know there and then whether or not there is other people that are potentially asymptomatic that you then should be sending home as well. So, so the rather than taking the blunderbuss approach of closing down whole bubbles, we will then be able to be more targeted and, and um, send away um, the, the pupils that are then more likely to be um, infectious. Um, so, sorry, let me just silence that. Um, so they, they will help and they're also very cheap. So um, uh, I think that the World Health Organization, the average cost of these things is going to be about two pounds um, and they can be mass produced. So once the production is, in, is, is up to the level um, uh, at which they can supply, because these are mainly going to be deployed in developing countries without labs um, uh, to facilitate testing where they've got huge pandemics. Um, although saying that, the WHO have only sort of uh, procured one in five of these tests to go to developing nations. Was, um, there's still going to be huge capacity for them to be deployed. Um, I think what I would push for, though, is for um, PHE accredited tests, because there are lots out there already. So I wouldn't advocate schools going out and procuring them themselves, but I would push from a, a sort of a, a, a national sort of union um, uh, standpoint that, that, that schools need to be prioritised. But I think the government have already, at, at, um, if you listen to Boris Johnson's um, statement about these, um, they're called RDTs, Rapid Diagnostic Tests. Um, on Friday of last week, he was um, he was emphasising um, hospitals, care homes, and then schools. Yeah, my apologies. There. I think I, I got my antigens and antibody tests mixed up. But it's the antibody tests that they're giving teachers in Scotland access to. Um, oh, is that it? So that's zero prevalence. So is that yes. to tell whether or not they've you've had they've, the they've infection? They've seen it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we see. Yeah. Um, yeah. I uh, so if you. You may, I think what we don't know is how to interpret the results. So I've had an antigen, I've had an antibody test and it was negative, um, but was fairly convinced I'd had the infection. And a lot of people who have tested positive have ended up having negative antibody tests. Now, antibodies are not the only way that you fight infection. So because we don't know really how to interpret the test, I wouldn't necessarily get so hung up that that's the priority um, uh, to, 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 to get um, done. Um, it's 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 a it's a research tool at best at the moment, um, but you're not going to be able to use the result in any meaningful way. I wouldn't have thought. Yeah, Matt, just want to talk through a, just a quick case study actually. So you've got a family, and um, the family there's, there's been a positive test in the family, um, and the rest of the family are are symptomatic, but they they test negative. Um, so what what could explain that? Um, they've probably got an infection with, with something else. Rhinovirus is, is really peaking in, um, in the community at the moment, um, particularly in your um, children. So, and rhinovirus causes a fever, sometimes a cough, um, and a, a more of a runny nose. 
um, but um, they um, they've probably got something else. And if there was a positive COVID case, um, that case may well be co-infection or asymptomatic initially. It may be that they've they've been recovering from COVID and therefore still carry it. It's very much dependent on. Um, the history of how long the index case has had it and and also what their contacts have been, what their risk factors have been, what the local context is. So without knowing that it would be it would be mere speculation, but it's much more likely to be something like rhinovirus. And, and uh, not but very a, not, soon it's going to be RSV. So um, yeah. you're going to have a whole host of all the normal viruses coming along. RSV, just tell us what RSV is. Respiratory syncytial virus. So that's one that you can get multiple times within the year, but it, it causes quite nasty infections in in um, in babies, um, uh, so like croup and things like that. So, so in terms of the testing, we, I mean, you, you you said six weeks ago that the testing is far more accurate than it was. So it's uh, yeah, you know, we can be very confident in the testing, eliminating that for the members. Okay, um, I just want to talk about um, steps we can take for our people who are providing a care bubble. So a lot of our grandparents in primary schools are still providing care for their um, for their for their children, their grandchildren, because they've um, formed a care bubble with the household. So um, what what are the risks for them, and, and what should they be doing to keep themselves safe? Um, so this really, um, really does depend on the on the local um, context. So, so if I was in a care bubble with an elderly relative um, in um, tier one, um, I would probably continue to do what I would have been doing um, uh, throughout, which was just making sure correct hand washing, making sure that when you're going to see them, you were well, um, and that um, were there to have been any um, evidence of cases that you'd been in touch with that you were probably then a bit more cautious about when you when you see them um, but generally reducing contacts is I think um, uh, the order of the of the day so um, in whatever tier you are in it would um, it is better for um, more vulnerable people if you see them less anyway because you may well have it asymptomatically and so reducing contacts more broadly across the country um, will have a greater impact um, uh, on sort of controlling the um, the epidemic. So not only in tier three should you be thinking of, of doing that, um, because obviously then it's 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 then illegal to do it to mix mm. indoors, except within support bubbles. So you would still be able to do that. But even in a support bubble, particularly if the person was um, elderly and vulnerable, um, then I would be limiting um, limiting contacts. And certainly. If you were meeting indoors in a poorly ventilated um, space, limiting the time that you had that contact, maximising social contact outside of physical contact, um, so via um, social media, um, uh, video um, calls, things like that, but also um, making sure that you wash your hands um, and that they um, maintain a distance from you um, uh, when, um, obviously, what I don't want to advocate is that for all our elderly relatives that we're not actually going to um, see them and um, uh, and give them some emotional and, 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 and comfort that way. But I think whatever you can do um, uh, to, to minimize the spread, because this thing will, the, you're more likely to spread it if you're there for a longer period of time in a close space. So, so if, you, if you are going to have contact, uh, make it make it brief. I'm not saying don't hug, don't kiss, because I think that's 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 just sort of inhumane. Um, but um, but I think um, so long as also they're aware of the risks and that they are making an informed choice of having having you there. Because some people are, are not as well informed as as you, as you perhaps are. So um, so making sure that um, that that they're happy to take that risk. Because often people won't say that they're. They're not happy, but if you give them the option, they might say, actually, just give me a call rather than coming over. Mm, yeah, I think a lot of, um, you know, grandparents are starting to, you know, it's quite a large prevalence in our school of grandparents picking up. But I think it's really important that we we, we go and educate them over what the, what the risks are and what they can do to keep themselves safe, um, especially as we're, we're tier two locally where we are. OK, so I think that's all the things I wanted to discuss with you. Um, so how are the questions looking? Dan, do we have any questions that came in on the chat before today? Uh, we had questions regarding ventilation, which I know are repeated on the on the chat. Um, but in in terms of the effectiveness of ventilation, particularly as the, the winter comes in, and particularly in line with um, members of staff who are highly anxious and trying to do everything they can 
um, about what the, the impact of that ventilation is going to be. Yeah, so, um, I mean, where the outbreaks have led to a super spreading event, so multiple people getting infected all at the same time, ventilation has been thought to play a, a, a large role in that. Um, I'm, I'm sort of off the top of my head thinking about the um, choir practices, the um, uh, the meat processing um, plants, that sort of thing. Um, uh, so the certainly increasing and improving the ventilation in your classrooms is going to have a positive impact on if you had an asymptomatic case that was shedding in the environment. Obviously, that's lessened um, if there's a constant airflow out of the classroom into a bigger space. So that doesn't necessarily have to be outside, but it, it, it has to be in a bigger sort of area, volume area, in order that there's less likelihood that if it is airborne, um, or if you're likely to get airborne transmission setting up, that it's it's less likely that that then, then leads to infection. Um, the um, I think so that my article in the in the Cambridge paper was um, around about obviously what do you then do in the winter if you're opening all these windows. Um, my point it was slightly taken out of context. My point wasn't necessarily that you you force the temperature down so that kids have to go into wear coats, but say if you opened the um, the window and there was a cold draft um, for the period of time that you were opening the window then what I'd probably advocate is, is still allowing the ventilation obviously um, but then closing the window I think what the what the um, uh, German health German health ministry is advocating is five minutes every hour um, in order to just get that to remove the stale air to flush it through um, uh, in order that you reduce the likelihood um, of, of airborne sort of transmission being um, being set up um, in addition to all of your other measures um, such as service surface cleaning and hand washing um, I think this is a tier three sort of not not tier three as in nationally I think this is a um, that the, the evidence base for this is is a lot lower it makes a lot more sense epidemiologically but with the caveat that bizarrely we still are not entirely certain on how this thing is spreading um, um, and that's because it's it's very difficult to do um, human studies on on obviously when you've got a potentially fatal disease to do human studies on it, um, but um, but certainly um, I think it's if you can do it it's a sensible measure, um, and it's it's certainly something whereby when you can't do distancing that it would be useful to do. Thanks. That's great, Tracy. How are we doing on the chat? Um, just a. a a couple of things that have come through. One of them, um, linking to ventilation, Matt, has asked about using CO2 detectors to see how much fresh air is coming in and then using those as a guide. Um, not a question, just been shared. Is yeah. that useful as well? It, it, it is. I've, I mean, I'm not um, I'm not an expert on this, but I know that the German um, uh, education um, ministry has provided some funding and that is one of the things that they are funding and CO2 detectors effectively tell you how stale the air is so um, it will flag for example when you need to improve the ventilation um, and in a setting whereby you obviously need to maintain the environment temperature I think it would be useful to not have to over ventilate so I think that's what it that's that, that that's where these things come into effect is that when you don't need to um, uh, open the windows and it's particularly cold outside then then you shouldn't effectively because you're not going to have any gain you're just going to the other thing which I'm not sure about is obviously we've seen quite a large amount of transmission in um, in meat processing in colder environments so the, the 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 worst thing would be to improve ventilation but to decrease the temperature and potentially in, increase the longevity of the virus in, in, in the air and on surfaces. So, so certainly temperature is important. The, the point um, about the, um, the needing extra clothing is, is basically for the, for the draft and the, and, the, and the intermittency of the, uh, uh, so you might get a bit of a drop in temperature um, while the windows are open. That was my, um, uh, the, the, the meaning behind the warm clothing. Matt, I had a question from a colleague yesterday about um, investing in these misting machines that we're seeing in some public spaces. Um, so, would you would you advocate schools thinking about those those sorts of machines, or is the cleaning, the enhanced cleaning that we're doing, um, um, enough? So, I think if this is referring to um, fogging, um, which That's what is, I meant fogging. Yeah, I meant fogging. That we don't. Yeah, we don't. We still don't do that 
in in hospital i think you do have to watch out for um uh the the sort of the snake oil salesmen in in, in <laughs> this i think i think i would if it's if it's surface spread which is and fogging is to remove things that are not killed by detergents so things like um c diff spores um which are very resilient to um sort of um chemical agents um, so then therefore you put you put higher harsher sort of um, free radical type ozone type things on them to, to break them down when that isn't the case as in is is in cov2 um sars cov2 that um that actually just the normal cleaning practices as has been advised detergents and and things like um sort of chlorine based cleaners thank you tracy how are we doing uh, yeah, another one. I don't know whether you can answer this, um, Matt. It may be more for you, Simon. It's about if we end up with a circuit break, is it going to be critical workers coming in again, do we think? Um, one school said they'd end up with practically a full school again. Yeah, I, I, I'll answer this one, Matt, if you don't mind. I mean, I, I think it's very unlikely we're going to get a circuit break in primary schools. Wales aren't doing it for two weeks, so I think it will be carrying on. And actually, some of the colleagues I talked to say that actually going through that whole press, uh, process of defining who is a key worker again um, would be you know, far more difficult than opening uh, fully. So I can't see a circuit break happening in, in, in our primary schools. I think what we are going to see our circuit breaks where we in, in individual schools we are seeing that in some of our secondary schools where there where, where there's multiple outbreaks and they're asking them to take two weeks off so it is a two-week foreclosure in those in those instances but i've only seen that happening in secondary schools uh, there may be some primary schools but i think uh, the idea of a, um, a, a circuit break uh, for primaries is, is unlikely thank you um matt do you know the desks facing forward this this is coming up is that really impacting uh, is it making any difference um that we have them mm -hmm. facing forward <laughs> should we keep them in smaller groups is what's being asked it um so there won't be there won't ever really be um evidence for this because even if you had a setting whereby one um country did forward facing desks and the others just continued with facing desks the the local context will be so vastly different that you'll never really be able to um, to know whether whether it does. Um, I think um, it makes sense if someone coughs to not be look because the the, the, vol the velocity of the droplets that come out of a cough um, are um, so rapid that you don't have enough chance to sort of turn away. So it makes sense that people aren't facing each other, but I don't think there's going to be um, uh, evidence for it. Um, it does feel a little bit sometimes tracing to be ideological this kind of whole thing of getting kids sitting in rows and uh, it's kind of uh, aligns with the uh, with, with some of the ideological views of how children should learn but uh, i know in primary schools it's uh, you know we, we certainly don't want our young children sitting in uh, victorian style uh, classrooms so, no. yeah okay. a couple of things have come up about the wider symptoms and i know i've been asked that about the sore throats and the headaches and the vomiting do we still need to i think that's what people are saying do we still need to hold on to the three key symptoms or should be look, looking more closely at the other ones sore throats is a lot i'm hearing about from people mm. um th this is this is a, a very challenging um subject because the, the 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 reason that we've restricted it to the four um, is because you get your biggest bang for your buck. Um, essentially, you don't overload the testing system while getting around about, I think it's about 83% of cases. Um, um, the, 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 the most fascinating thing that I've found about this um, virus is how it, it presents so different in, in each individual. I, I, there were the classical cases of fever um, and, and cough, um, but of, of the cases that, um, that um, we saw in hospitals, particularly in those that were most vulnerable, the elderly, um, the, 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 you could think of anything and it was, a, it was a presenting feature going from sort of confusion, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, um, abdominal obstruction. So we were actually seeing people where their bowels just stopped working effectively and emptying. Um, it's, it's a fascinating disease from a, a medical standpoint as to why um, why these things happen but I think from your from your angle you you really are not going to be able to focus on anything other than fever dry cough 
Um, aside from, I think last time when we spoke, I did say, if you had a case of um, COVID confirmed, and then you found that there were other cases of these sort of non-specific symptoms, um, then I would certainly be discussing those with your um, uh, local public health, because it may well be that they are the early signs of what will then form an outbreak. Um, if you've got two cases already, then certainly that would be the case. Um, but for your single cases, if you then found that three other people went home with um, vomiting, which they would have to be isolated anyway, so 48 hours symptom free for nausea and vomiting, um, still stands irrespective of um, irrespective of whether or not um, COVID's around. So don't don't forget that norovirus is going to be rearing its ugly head very soon anyway. One would hope that with all the kids washing their hands, that that will be um, hopefully something which we'll see less of. Um, but, um, but certainly be mindful, it, it doesn't have to present with fever and cough. Um, be mindful that some people are asymptomatic, but I think for those that you're advocating and um, testing, it has to be fever, cough, um, uh, loss of taste and smell. So Matt, there was a, there was a, paedi a paediatrician on um, Channel 5 News with Emily Crawford the other week, and, and, and she said that there's no real way of distinguishing between your, your winter viruses and, and, um, and COVID. And no. would, you, would you subscribe to that view, yeah? Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. remember, SARS-CoV-2 is one of um, seven and, and, um, and four of them are winter viruses. So even in its own family um, of, um, of viruses, um, they're all seasonal. Um, and then you, you add into that influenza, parainfluenza, RSV, rhinovirus, picornavirus, all these lovely things that knock my patients for six when they come into, into hospital. Um, it's going to be a, an interesting time. But um, but. I think, I mean, if you were to look at infections in total um, over the winter, we're probably going to see more um, infections from non-COVID non still. It's just going to be like a needle in a haystack as to how, I mean, thankfully, we've nearly all hospitals now have rapid um, diagnostics for when people come in. So even before they leave the emergency department, we're hopefully going to be picking these people up so that we stop transmission within within hospitals. And then the hope is that with these rapid diagnostic tests, that similar things can happen in the community. So that if you have got someone just with a runny nose and a cough or or diarrhea, that actually you can test them as well and and, and, and cast the net more widely, um, mm -hmm. which I think would be would be a big game changer. Interesting, Matt. I did a, a school improvement visit to a special school where there's medically vulnerable children, and and staff attendance and people attendance has never been higher. So they think the way that they're working in terms of an enhanced hygiene, yeah. working in those tight bubbles is uh, is something that they'll learn from. So. It's yeah. interesting it's you know it, it does have benefits the sort of things we're doing for the wider uh, winter spread doesn't it and i think attendance in our primaries has been quite good across uh, yeah across i mean countries. certainly australia has never seen um such a low um uh, pan, uh a flu um seasonal flu um outbreak they, they, their case numbers have been dramatically reduced now whether or not that's because i think that's that's largely because of the medicate the, the, the interventions the distancing the hand washing i suspect also that that co-infection has a, a plays a big part because viruses tend to sort of occur sort of sequentially you occasionally get co-infection but um, they seem to thrive um, in their own little pockets um, and so um, and so um, I think that that's that's part of it but but certainly like if you haven't yet managed to sort of um, uh, procure sort of long-term funding for things like sinks and things I certainly think going forward this is this is a no-brainer really to stop norovirus because we're always flawed with norovirus and flu each year it closes hospital cancer services and hospital surgery services and and as a society we know that those things are um, vectorized by children um, so I think that that's that's definitely going to be a, 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 a one of the the benefits from from having gone through what is a very painful pandemic and Matt, you spoke about um, recommending that all school staff get a flu vaccine this year, whether they're in the, in the age group or vulnerable, because there, there have been some cases where there's been co-infection with flu and, and COVID, and it can be quite a, quite a significant um, extended risk, aren't it, if you get yeah. them together? Yeah, so, so I had, I've definitely, I, I was vaccinated on the first day that it was, it was open to us. If you are um, in one of the groups, either medically vulnerable um, or um, in the age groups um, specified, I think they're, they're, they're struggling a little bit with supply um, because the uptake has been so phenomenal this, this year. Um, but keep persevering. It's never too late um, to um, have the flu vaccine. We're, um, we're, obviously, it helps if you've had it early enough so that you can generate the vaccine um, response but but just keep don't don't give up if you are struggling to get to to get it if you are um, eligible 
Um, I wouldn't advocate it necessarily if you're not um, eligible, because I think that if you're if you're unlikely to have got it in the first place, I think we do need to focus the vaccine supplies on on the people that are more likely to suffer and the more, more likely to spread it. Um, but but certainly, if we ended up having more vaccine than than um, than we're using, then they all they will use every single last um, file. Um, so um, if you end up being eligible and you weren't initially, then then please do get it. Tracy, how are we doing? Yeah, there's three that are rolling together here, which is questions about um, the actual virus being passed on via hand dryers in toilets. The use of hand dryers. Can it be passed on through paper? There's been something on Sky about it going on through paper and letters and passing it on through outdoor equipment. So those are all questions about, can it be, what do we need to do? Should we use the dryers, etc.? Yeah, so, um, so probably is the answer for all of them. Um, the paper I always, um, from the studies that I saw um, was, was less of a risk, but there was a, um, I think it was done in Australia, it was the um, the uh, uh, the one where they sort of made it maximal laboratory conditions against light and against um, temperature, so they maintained temperature and humidity. Actually, paper bizarrely was was one of the um, environments where you could co continue to culture it. Um, but I think the reason paper in a real world setting is is less likely to is because in a real world real world setting it will desiccate the virus. So the, the one change to the lab condition to real life is, is fluctuations in humidity. And I think as soon as this virus um, sort of desiccates and dries out, becomes smaller particles, it becomes less viable. Um, I haven't heard about hand dryers, but I think less so because hand dryers don't, um, although they, um, I mean, I suppose in, in one way, if a toilet has poor ventilation and it's in an enclosed space, they are continually sucking and recycling the air, but it gets quite hot in most hand dryers. Um, and so I, I don't, I can't see, there's usually, there's an element in there that, that would, um, would prevent that. And obviously you're drying your hands, which you've just been washed. So I don't really see why hand dryers would be um, certainly if you don't dry your hands and then you you get your, your hands get sore because you're not drying your hands and then you don't want to wash them anymore would be a bigger risk I would have thought um, but if you have paper towels um, perhaps paper towels are, uh, are better um, I, I really don't know on um, on that one the surface spread um, yes it, it, it almost certainly the cases of cross infection so whereby someone has it and then someone next door to them gets it if they're not symptomatic is most likely probably from um, surface transmission. That's certainly what we think is happening in hospitals when we've had outbreaks, that it's been sort of contact. And hence every every single person I go and see now, I um, I burn through plastic, I wear a fresh pair of gloves and a, and a fresh apron for every single patient, even though I know that they've just tested negative. Um, but purely because I don't know whether it's in the environment and I'm, I'm spreading it. Um, outdoor equipment, if it's just rained, it's going to have washed off. Um, and also, um, um, I think um, they're going to be washing their hands when they come in anyway. So, um, so I think it's 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 less likely, but certainly um, it's a possibility. I wouldn't I wouldn't focus on play equipment. I'd focus on desks and 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 sort of the things which they're handling indoors, because obviously the 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 volume is lower, and therefore that any contamination that is emanating from someone, be they symptomatic or asymptomatic, is going to be much greater indoors. The final few, I think this is just a comment, people are struggling getting the flu vaccine and can't get it and what are the local authorities doing? I know Cheshire East are trying to put that out through maintained schools and looking what is left in the discussions going on about academies, don't know about West Simon. And the other one linked to that is, can the flu vaccine create any immune response to help you fight COVID? Um, so the first point, I don't think there is anything as an individual that you can do to um, fix what is sort of a chronic problem with um, sort of vaccine production and supply in that absolutely every country on the planet um, is trying to get more flu vaccine for their population um, and the companies which make these um, vaccines just can't ramp up production plus they've got to um, make now, um, they're making a COVID vaccine, so all the glass bottles, uh, bizarrely, the, the limiting factor is how many glass bottles they can sometimes uh, manufacture and procure. So I don't think there's much you can do individually, just keep, um, just, I, I think the main thing you can do is just don't give up, just keep, keep trying and be patient. 
Um, the the answer about the the question about the the vaccine is it is 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 a vaccine um, devoted to flu um, going to um, provide some protection? Possibly, actually. And in, in, in fact, they've just started a trial looking at um, one of the oldest vaccines we've got, the the BCG vaccine for TB. Um, the theory being that if you can just prime the immune response to expect a virus. Um, then it will be better able to treat um, to to um, to sort of cope with other viruses. So, although you won't have the specific antibodies, because remember what most vaccines are trying to do is to generate an, an, an antibody response, so that as soon as the the virus enters your body, antibodies stick to it and you kill it before it causes symptoms and you spread the infection. Um, what this may well do is prime the immune response, prime the T cells and all the other um, immune cells in order to be sort of awake effectively would for for um for kind of a better term but um but um but it, it possibly and i think that's the other reason i would probably have it is that um it's not gonna it's certainly not going to distract the body so if, so um you're not going to be at greater risk from get, uh, getting covid if you have the flu vaccine it's going to be t- switching on your immune system so if anything it's going to help but i don't know whether it will okay thanks i think that pulls it all together thanks simon Thanks, Tracy. That's uh, that's great. Thank you for doing those questions so well. Uh, Matt, thank you so much. Um, we're just about coming up to the hour now. So um, I just want to thank you again, Matt, for your involvement. I think um, you've certainly given um, thousands of teachers confidence that we can open safely and that we can continue doing our job as teachers. I think it's been a phenomenal effort from uh, teachers this half term um, across the country and especially uh, those teachers working in those those high risk areas. But the good news is um, that even, even if it is uh, rising in our communities, that we can stay relatively safe um, in our schools but we must be vigilant because uh, staff to staff spread is, uh, is is key and that's what we're seeing um, across our schools so um, it's really important that, that people get a, a good rest now because it's been a, a really intense time in schools and I think it's a hyper vigilance Matt we've we, we've all been hyper vigilant in schools trying to make sure we're following things and and we're missing some of the you know, some of the things we thought we'd never miss, you know, those uh, the, those big whole school assemblies were missing and uh, um, the, the Christmas the Christmas um, pantomime and the Christmas production, all those things are, uh, they keep us going actually in many, many ways. Mm. So, um, but I think I think children um, have, um, have made a, a really good return, but I think we're all ready for that uh, for that week break now. So thanks everybody yeah. for your involvement in the Chronicast. Can I just Matt, say just on that, um, yeah. uh, Simon, that I think I think the, the, the looking after yourselves is, is a key because this is this is a marathon, not a um, a sprint, and and the, and the, the potentially the worst with winter is 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 yet to come with regards to infections. And I think um, if there are um, sort of uh, certainly with regards to what we've seen in the NHS when we've gone through the first wave, is that, that it had a significant effect on staff from a mental health perspective. And I think whatever support from um, the um, NAHT and the teachers unions. Um, providing to staff for looking after your own mental health and well-being and um, because ultimately you need to be well for the for the children so um and um so i think whatever um, you can do to promote that would be uh, would be important there's this the british attitude of keep on and carry on is, is 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 wrong people struggle for far too long and they should they should um speak to someone if they need yeah, I noticed Andy Maller's on the chat as well. So Andy, we do uh, want to do a Corona cast, but particularly on wellbeing and what um, practical strategies we can play. So Andy, let's have a chat about that because Andy's got a, a wellbeing role within um, uh, within his uh, work on on, on staff uh, and on staff wellbeing and insurance. So we definitely want to get that in the diary quite soon, Andy. So let's have a chat. Matt, thank you so much, um, and we will uh, see you. Uh, hopefully, we can touch base in the, before before Christmas, and we can uh, see how things are going. But Matt, really appreciate support, and also you the way that you go and um, put things out on Twitter that really help us, you know, distilling all that massive information, but which is uh, really helpful because it is school specific stuff. And we'll send out the heat map that you shared uh, yesterday. Right. Bye, everybody. Have a great half term and I'll see you uh, see you all soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Tracy. As Thanks, well. everybody. Uh, if anyone I've just seen on a couple of people have asked about joining the invite list. If you just I'll wait on a couple of minutes, if you just put your email address in the chat um, and I will add you onto that distribution list. Um, Thanks, Matt. Well done. Thanks, Matt. Brilliant as usual. Thank you.
Uh, end the end this for everyone now. Thanks, everyone.